Hey all, David Sable coming to you once again for creativity from the other side. When we talk to the most incredible people in our universe, the most creative people, the most productive people, the most innovative people, the people who are making a difference in our industry and in the world. So I'm excited today to be with a new FOD, a new friend of David. Thank you for having me. Sergio Lopez Ferrero, who is the global head of production at Publicis, but mm -hmm. also the CEO of production. So we're going to talk about that, the difference between mm -hmm. being global head of production and being CEO of production. But I mm -hmm. think there's, there's a really interesting story there that I think it's important for everybody yeah, we can talk about that. to listen to. We have lots of connections mm -hmm. in my new life, Anomaly, mm -hmm. in my old life, um, Thompson, Wonderman mm -hmm. Thompson, which rest in peace. Mm -hmm. And so we have what to talk about there. But maybe most importantly, I think you're going to be the chair of the in-person 2020, 2024 mm -hmm. cutting edge jury. Yeah. And you're going to put together a jury of the most incredible people. Amazing group of people. In our industry. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to hold that to the end. Mm -hmm. And let's just start talking first about what you do. Tell me about the, the global CEO and the global head of production. So how does that work? How does that work? So production has changed a lot in the last 10 years. It's always been in, in flux, right? Production is, production is everything that we do in advertising. It's, Every creativity that we do will have Without to be executed. There's nothing. It's just an right? idea. like media needs stuff to be to be produced. So the story of production is very much linked to the story of everything else that, that we do. And now we got to a point where it's so intricate and complicated. Um, if you think about all the channels, all the platforms, how we can connect with people on a personal level, that yes, focus on the execution is not enough. So you have to figure out what the strategy for for a client is going to be. How do you that's where terms have been introduced now in the in the dictionary of production, like content supply chain and delivery. And how do you combine everything? How do you combine creativity? And creativity means a lot of things, right? Creativity means uh, engagement for for people. Creativity might mean awards. Creativity is very measurable, right? On on what is on what is rated when you put something on social media, with how that creative is distributed. In all the in all the channels, so that's why publicists will look at it in two ways. One was, we we have created uh, units that deal with with production, all kinds of production. We have prodigious, we have PXP, we have some specialty brands like Boomerang in in the Netherlands or Harbor, which is incredible film film content or Translate Plus. But then the need we we've been working on having an overall strategy across all the agencies on what is their contribution to their work to be to be done at the best way. So From I think media, one of the commerce, things that you just said was so interesting. It's this notion of the supply chain, mm -hmm. of feeding the beast, mm -hmm. if you will. And I think I don't think about it anymore as media or whatever mm -hmm. in terms of or, or even live in terms of distribution. I always think of it always in terms of a platform. Mm -hmm. So it's, for example, back in the early days of CRM, Everybody thought all you had to do was buy the system. Mm -hmm. What they didn't pay attention to is that mm -hmm. you actually have to feed the system. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just a software loop. Yeah. And I think that's the thing, right? So all of this, all the platforms, whether you're on... And by the way, I consider linear TV today a platform because mm -hmm. it comes from a digital source. Mm -hmm. So everything is a platform. Where it print, mm -hmm. the things that are still in print mm -hmm. come from a digital source. Mm -hmm. Outdoor, mm -hmm. out of home comes from a digital source. So you have to feed the software. If you don't feed the software, there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you first have to understand the customer engagement, right? Like how does the customer engage with the brand and all the content that you do? And then you have to connect the big idea, what we call the creative platform, with all the with all the platforms, all the channels that that consumer engages with. So in the middle, when you said like feeding the machine, yes, of course, there's a technology play, right? And, and everybody's doing their own flavor. We did a partnership with Adobe and Launch BX, which is a technology platform that connects all those things. But then to translate that creativity into what media, commerce, uh, to, to talking about CRM needs, you need to understand modularization of that content without degradation of the creative quality, right. which is it's very easy to chop it and slice it and dice it, and then it sucks the creativity out of it, which is what some people have done. But how do you modularize that, that content? You create a super shoot, you do it in an efficient way, 
So, because the budget hasn't changed. So one of the things that you talk about is the difference of production going from entertainment mm -hmm. to engagement. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, because traditionally it's been about entertaining or doing things, doing those great moments in time, especially on, on traditional platforms that people that people engage or wow. I'm just not sure that with the saturation of media and like people are engaging now with five times more platform and 10 times more content than they were 10 years ago, right? So I'm not sure that I have a lot of time to be wowed in a very simplistic, in a very simplistic campaign. I think that is an ongoing conversation. I was talking about like that modularized content, you turn into content that is distributed in platform, you talk to that person in multiple, multiple channels, and then you optimize and make the conversation more relevant from a from a group to an audience to then hopefully an, an individual. And we're going to talk about that in a second because I think the whole notion of the individual personalization is very important. Mm -hmm. Actually, maybe we'll talk about it now. So I think one of the things you said, which which resonated with me because I saw this in the early days of Facebook when on the Creative Council, which I was a member mm -hmm. of early, early on as one of the founding members, actually, nobody wanted to hear about Facebook being a direct media. Mm -hmm. It insulted the creative talent in the room. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that you talked about was personalization not being accepted mm -hmm. by some of the bigger creative talent because mm -hmm. they looked at it as kind of direct and saying that's mm -hmm. not what we do. Mm -hmm. And yet it is core to everything that's happening today. So how do you deal with that? It's similar to other industries. We say in industries like design, I think there is now, when we talk about creativity, I say that creativity is the new digital, right? Like people say digital, what is digital? Digital can be from e-commerce to a banner and everything in between. Creativity is the same thing. We look at creativity as a whole. And I think there is a separation of understanding between what is a creative platform versus platform creativity. And, and creative platform, in the same way that design firms now are smaller than they were 20 years ago, but they're more strategic and high level. I think that that's the role of a creative agency, create that creative platform that the brand is going to live with. But then you have to do platform creativity and that belief at least more in the world of production. Right, totally. And, and that when, when you understand that, how does that apply? Not just, not just from a, a land grabbing kind of way, you have things that are changing. AI is disrupting, so you can create things quicker. You have in social media, the world of creators, right? Like does a creator live in creative or does it live in production? They're very executional, but they have their own ideas. So because of that, that creative platform world uh, and that platform creativity, platform creative lives better in the world, in the world of production, and that's how it connects creativity with media. So I hope everybody's paying attention because I think this is like a masterclass. <laughs> so thank you. The notion of the creative platform, the big idea, mm -hmm. which has to live in lots of different places, and, and it's not about and matched mm -hmm. luggage as it once was, but rather mm -hmm. about engagement. Mm -hmm. But that engagement happens on the platform yeah. that the creative goes through. So you got the creative platform, and you have platform creative. Mm -hmm. That's really. It's, it's an incredible way to look at it. Yeah, because when you look at different markets, markets consume platforms in a different way. Right? Like you and I have had global roles. You see the difference in social media between China, Germany, and the United States. Oh, you cannot course. imagine three different ways of consuming social media. So yes, saying this is what is going to be for everybody is just not is just not a way to do it. And how they how they express themselves culturally, and then you talk about personalization. Personalization up until now. People have been talking about messaging optimization and just thinking like, hey, Sergio, you're in New York, go to Joe's Pizza. But that's not just it. When you look at it from a content point of view, at a time where the time that we engage with, you're talking about Facebook on Instagram, is down to 1.3 seconds. In a visual world, you need to react to something visually very quickly. And what it might appeal to me about going to New York on a weekend might be totally different that would appeal to a younger audience or an older, older audience. So how do you create those those assets that can actually um, cannot adapt to the different to the different so I'm without shift. killing the creative. So I'm going to shift a little bit, and we're going to come back to some of this discussion. So the shift is: a number of years ago, you did an interview in London where you were called the best advertisement for London mm -hmm. ever, mm -hmm. and it's actually it's 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 a wonderful it's a wonderful um, interview. I love it, mm -hmm. and a lot of it is around Brexit, and maybe we can come mm -hmm. back to that. But I think the piece that you talk about is the difference between looking inside and looking outside, mm -hmm. which to me had absolutely nothing to do with London, although it had mm -hmm. everything to do with Brexit maybe, yeah. but is true to what we do. Mm -hmm. So could you talk about that a little bit? How, did, how, does that, how do you feel about that today, 
the inside versus the outside. People aren't coming back to office. They are coming back to office. They want to work distributed. They don't want to work distributed. They don't want to be part of the team. They do want to be part of the team. You were very clear in that interview mm -hmm. that looking inside was critical and bringing the people together mm -hmm. in a diverse way, which is why you loved London at mm -hmm. that particular time, was so important. Well, I wish things were as simple as they were, as they were 10 years ago, right? Like now we're going, I cannot remember a time that was as disruptive to the world of advertising and creativity and production as it is now. You have technology disruption, which is going to change the way the way we work, not in a bad way. I think that we, we always look at like um, like a friend of mine says, we always look at containers of the present um, to fit things of the future, future, which doesn't which doesn't work because AI is not a threat. It opens opportunities to a lot of things. We're going through a massive change on, as you say, the the workplace and even generationally, um, a generation that enjoyed having a stable a stable job towards a generation that actually wants to cho choose what they work on and they want to be able to move around and they. They don't value one of the things that I found in the last five years. It's more and more talent does not want a fixed job. They want to choose the project, the brand, uh, how long they work on. So it's, it changes how you build cultures within the within the workplace. So I think that in a moment like this, there are two things. So the way I look at it is two things. One, being aware of what's going to the, on the outside and be accepting that that some things are coming to an end or there is a moment of change. The only the only constant has always been change. So right, and evolution has always been on the right side of history. So let's be aware of everything that's going on and reshaping the inside to accommodate those things or actually take advantage of those things. I don't think that, that in this kind of changes, you can say, is this a good change or a bad change? The winners are going to be the people that can adapt quickly enough because with working remotely, that opens the market to a lot of talent that before were not as represented in fantastic markets, uh, places where holding companies might not have had an office or, or advertising agencies might not have opened, but you have fantastic talent. So uh, give us an example. What would, be, what would be your best example or most interesting example? Mm -hmm. You can look at markets. I love markets in Southeast Asia because they have, very distinctive, they have a very distinctive look and feel. I look at the visual world that is created in Thailand, Vietnam, and it's something that appeals. I mean, just look at Korea with, with K-pop, right? When right. I look at what is my Korean talent base in, in Europe or, or the United States, it's not a big base of talent. And yet, great part of the of the, yeah, of, the BIB of, of Korea is K-pop. So people are consuming K-pop, and yet right. we don't have a big K-pop or, or Korean insights in, in our teams. Be able to just connect with those people and bring them over for projects that are relevant. That would be a great change on what we, on what we do. Right, I agree with you. I mean, I, I discovered many years ago, I started traveling mm -hmm. a long time ago. And it's interesting that you bring up Thailand. Thailand was always an incredibly mm -hmm. creative center for us. Mm -hmm. And so if using your analogy of creative platform, you might not have been able to use their expression, mm -hmm. but their idea, their creative platforms were always brilliant. Yeah. And I'm going back. 40 years, I don't know mm -hmm. how long ago I'm going back, yeah. a long time ago, but they were always brilliant. Mm -hmm. And then I found more recently Vietnam as well. Like Vietnam is people are, yeah. are just amazing. Yeah. And their ability to, and, and I think part of it gets to, you know, if you remember the story when Romania opened up, mm -hmm. they had went right to cellular mm -hmm. because they didn't have an infrastructure of mm -hmm. copper. So yeah. they, they literally jumped 30 right, years. digital talent. Yeah. And I think that's what happened in, in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. They didn't have that middle place. Like one morning they wake up and everybody's got an mm -hmm. iPad. Yeah. Like every young person has, the, that's what you do. You mm -hmm. save up money, you put yourself an iPad. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about that, that they didn't have a history of having to move it. They just woke up one morning and that's where they mm -hmm. were. That kind of changes the way you look at how and you that's why you have great digital talent in Romania. I mean, it's it's become it's become a digital hub for the rest of the region. Yeah. For the same reason, right? So you yeah. have the same reason. So just, let's come back just to the, the notion of, of production. So one of the things you said, which I love again, which I love everything you said. Thank you. Is that <laughs> <laughs> production is putting things together. Mm -hmm. Now back, we were just talking about this before we, we started this discussion, 
it used to be that all the production pieces were siloed. Mm -hmm. So you had film, those are mm -hmm. sort of like the kings. Mm -hmm. You had print, as complex as it was back in the day, that was sort of like factory work. Mm -hmm. You maybe had radio in the middle someplace, but each set of producers was different. Each idea of production mm -hmm. was different. And each set of outputs was different. And maybe you sat at the center and looked at your creative platform and said, okay, mm -hmm. I, this is how I use to create my campaign. But you never looked at your production mm -hmm. in the same way. So just talk a little bit about how you pull it all together because your notion of engagement is such. So mm -hmm. whether it's outdoor, whether it's, you said you had to look at how the consumer engages with the content. Mm -hmm. Which to me is is partially the is partially the the platform, but it's also the com combination of the platform mm -hmm. and the creator, because mm -hmm. that's that can change, as you know, yeah. that can change the way you you engage. Well, you look at one of the things that I've been talking about for the last few years is production strategy and having visibility over what the brand expression looks like, and that is only possible through two things. One elevating the role of producers or finding a new breed of people that are able to do that production strategy across the board. As you say, producers were very much about execution. They were fantastic practitioners in their craft at a time where technology wasn't democratized, right? You're talking about like film was there. Film was there because on my first shoot, the director of photography would look through the hall and say, we got it. And everybody had to believe that that individual that said, we got it. Right, and it was the process was very cumbersome. So you need people that really understood what it took step by step to get there, which is not the case anymore. Like we're all, it's it's a lot easier to be collaborative. When and I'm by the way, in print too, in and print. I mean print too, and people print, used you to have take a razor <laughs> and scrape right, film, right. and so that's how they would that's how they would make it brilliant. Then you'd go on press. I mean, how many times I was on press at two o'clock in the morning to make sure that the mm -hmm. colors were right. Yeah. This is what we used to do. So it was very technical. And unless you knew the right individuals or had the right individuals, it wouldn't look right. And that has changed and technology has been more democratized. Meaning like we know you can print different variations with different colors in the right stock within minutes. The, the film um, process has become a lot more collaborative. We're all sitting in Video Village and have a conversation with the director or the director of photography and what it looks like. So the value of the producer as a practitioner has shifted to a different way. And there is a need for somebody that actually looks at the overall brand and works with the client on what is your ambition, how things look. Because again, consumers interact with the brand in multiple, in right. multiple, and in then multiple places. How do you how do you link all those pieces? And how do you link all those places? Because back that's... in the day we linked it because maybe we said here's mm -hmm. an eight hundred number. Yeah. You know, call or whatever. You, but that was basically... you have QR codes, yeah. you have you have your website, you have like the whole funnel is connected. You can have measure. a link, a live link, just did you press? I mean, there's so many mm. different ways to... And that's why production now is, there's a lot of conversations about technology because without technology, you cannot do that at scale. But you don't believe in tech for tech. No, I mean, tech Tech is a tool and then you have to feed the tech. I mean, yeah, but there's went... so many people in your job, I hate to tell you, in other places, other mm -hmm. agencies and other holding companies who talk about tech for tech's sake. They love talking about tech mm -hmm. and you can see it in their work. You can see even what they put into the award shows. Mm -hmm. It's all about the tech. It's not about the platform. It's not about the engagement. It's about the tech. Mm -hmm. I feel that production is very much like, like a restaurant, right? Like you're creating an experience for the person. And people want a great meal. They don't care about what the kitchen looks like. Exactly. They don't care how long it's taken, what the they process hope it's is. Clean. They hope it's clean. <laughs> you might go to a three Michelin star restaurant and you might enjoy seeing the process. But people care about the experience. And you food. coming from Spain know a lot about it. Yeah, I mean, like, in three it's like, like so some of the fantastic best. food. <laughs> some, some restaurants have great food. You definitely don't want to get into the kitchen uh, because that's Spanish process. Um, but it's, but it, it's the same thing with advertising. You want, you want a great, consumers want a great experience. They don't, they don't celebrate what we might have done in the back that was smart or brilliant or, or all those things. There was one of the, one of the campaigns that, um, that I worked on for, for Microsoft for Expo, Survival Billboard, which is very well in awards. It was, it could have been technically very complicated. And I always talk about that. It was a billboard with eight contestants over there and people voted online what kind of weather 
they want to inflict in those people and those people came out of the billboard one by one until there was a winner. And I remember at the beginning, it, was, it had been a very complicated thing of people vote online, we connected directly with these weather generating things that then measure, and it was incredibly expensive. It was, it was so expensive that the client was going to kill that, that project because they, it, wasn't, it wasn't, didn't provide a good ROI for them. And we said, well, we don't need that. We, we do a voting platform and then we can have few individuals putting like a snow cannon and another few individuals like you do um, practical things in, in, in film. And that cut the budget by two thirds. Yeah. So <laughs> the smartness of connecting voting with stuff didn't actually, was gonna, it was not gonna bring any better experience, any value right. other than let's do it. But it was a do it because you could do it. Do and it because you could do it. And, right. and what we could enjoy, we got the same results for much better. So I don't believe in technology for the sake of technology. Good. So dare I say AI. Mm -hmm. so let's talk about how you see AI impacting. So I think some of the things you talk about are, number one, how that impacts us going on location, how it impacts talent, mm -hmm. our ability to create, I don't want to say fake talent, but mm -hmm. to create talent out of the ether, if you mm -hmm. will. So what's your view? I think it's going to supercharge individuals that are creative. It will have an impact on people that are doing things that are more um, mechanical or, or does not add a lot of value because it will accelerate data analysis. It's going to, it's going to uh, accelerate versioning and adaptation. So yes, there will be, there'll be people that we impacted. Are those the kind of jobs that people enjoy, that they see a progression of their career? I don't think so, right? Like, I don't think, I haven't, I have, actually, I'm going to measure my ways. I've only met a few individuals through my life who enjoyed a 40 year career cutting 30 seconds into 15 second commercials and changing that. That's not, as individuals, that's not a fulfilling most of the time career. But when I look at the possibilities on the creative side, it's going to supercharge people with, in the way that all the technologies have, have impacted other areas. Like, I was, I was thinking about, the impact of technologies like post-production, right? When just in the last decade has gone from massive hardware investments and, and technologies that were only accessible to a few people to now most of post-production done on, on IMAX and, and, and tools accessible to, to everybody. And that's what's enabled series like The Mandalorian or Game of Thrones, like doing, doing series of that level of quality for television that relies so much on visual effects would have been unthinkable 10, 15 years ago. So the impact of AI is going to impact other things. Is how creative things about campaign, how do they, how do they concept, right? When they're not limited by the inspiration that they can get on a few magazines or or online. So it's interesting you bring up the Mandalorian. Do you know that in the original Star Wars, mm -hmm. there's that one scene where they're looking at the Death Star projection, mm -hmm. and it's sort of all red lines and it's being yeah. projected. Up. It took two and a half weeks. Mm -hmm of the biggest computers in the United States to generate to render that. that piece, to render what today your kid could do <laughs> in a millisecond. But then the question the is even, it's not it's, about time. It's pretty it's amazing. If, but the question that I always pose on, on those kind of things is, if George Lucas had had the ability to actually fulfill his full vision, was that exactly how he wanted to look like? Or was that what he had to settle because it took a long time to be rendered. Like we all used to be in rooms when, when technology was, you know, wasn't as mature as it is now, having to make compromises and say, okay, we'll do that because that's as far as we can get it. Well, I think that AI is really gonna be able to bring the vision of, of creatives and clients alike. So the question, that's a really interesting question. Would he have done something else? Would it have made the movie better? Would your engagement with the movie have been better? Would it be more famous? Would more, and maybe, I mean, I maybe, maybe see. not. I always see these curves of, of, of adoption where in, the first, where in the first phase, which is where we are now, doing a lot of images of monkeys with, with spacesuits in, in the moon and things that like, like that. There is a time of exploration and, and, and awe and we're just like oh, jumping it. on it and, and, and a lot of things are driven by the possibilities. And I think that then we're gonna start having the breed of people that are natives on that technology or have explored right. and actually can use it in the right. In yeah, the right my way. analogy is always early television was radio. Mm -hmm. People yeah. actually stood in front of microphones and read mm -hmm. scripts. Yeah. And then the second phase was watching boom microphones mm -hmm. falling down yeah. as they were doing theater pieces, set pieces, because they didn't mm -hmm. know how to they didn't know how to use them. 
Yeah. And the shadows would fall all over the place. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if people go back to archives of, of things like Shorts Magazine, right? And you could tell what technology was launched that month because it was in all music videos. Right. right? Like all the music videos would get like <laughs> places in like Molinero Frame Store or places like that would buy the latest technology and they would apply to the music video. And you think like, what has, you know, these rotating things have to do? And it was, and then it gets. But I want to come back for a second to Mandalorian and um, Game of Thrones because I use mm -hmm. that ex I use that analogy all the time. So as you know, there was somebody in the industry who was talking a lot about all technology is about faster, cheaper. Mm -hmm. And I would go to clients and say, wait a second, your work has to go up against Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones is not faster, cheaper. Mm -hmm. They're not turning that stuff out quick and it ain't cheap. Mm -hmm. So if your work is only faster and cheaper and it isn't better, it's going to look like garbage mm -hmm. against the quality of the work that we have. Because in my view, I don't think we've ever had, this is to me, this is the golden age of production. Mm -hmm. We've never had such a high quality mm -hmm. of production as we have today. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. blown away mm -hmm. by even little shows that I watch. And sometimes it's not about the technology even, because I think people are paying more attention in general to the craft, and we'll come back to that word because it's, mm -hmm. it's a critical word. People are paying much more attention to the craft, so the acting is better, the scripts are better, the general setups mm -hmm. are better. Interestingly enough, um, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, if you had followed the analysts, we would only be doing CGI mm -hmm. today. Nobody ever would have gone on you know, going on location again. Mm -hmm. And yet, every great show, whether it's the Vikings or whether it's mm -hmm. Game of Thrones, it happens on location. All goes to location mm -hmm. because they want they want that realism mm -hmm. and then they build the world around it. Mm -hmm. But the world that they build around it looks that much more real mm -hmm. because they've based it in reality. So mm -hmm. somebody always somebody once said that a lie that's based in truth is always believed mm -hmm. as sort of a lie that's based in truth. The truth is where you are in location, and then the lie is the CGI you build mm -hmm. around it. Absolutely. I think that when you say that it's an exciting time to be on production, I remember the first time that I was MD of, of a production unit and an RFP made it to my, on my lab, and he said, what value will you bring to, these, to this engagement? And I've always thought about production as, Craftsmanship, yes, but the conversation was always about cheaper, faster. What you're talking, what you're talking about. Now production has shifted at a time where I think that cheaper, faster will diminish because when you look at the production spend on any client's budget, it's ten percent, fifteen percent of the budget. We've been talking about efficiencies for over a decade, so we might be able to bring five, ten percent savings over the ten percent, right? So the impact of cheaper, faster it's going to be smaller and smaller for clients. The value is on producing content that performs better right. because then we bring value on media, right? So, and that, like, how do you bring value on media? Well, you bring value by doing content that is relevant and engaging, whatever that means. That might mean better craftsmanship. That might be messages that are more relevant, messages that are fit in platform, and then distributed in a way that can be optimized. And that's the combination of how do you balance craftsmanship and quality and something that visually people engage with, with feeding a machine that is very sophisticated, that can do a lot of things, to have relevant conversations with people or conversations that are meaningful to me as a, as a consumer. And that is why it's such an incredible time to be in production, because we're reinventing it. It's not an evolution like it was before from a film camera to a digital camera, from something that was done manually to computers. Now it's is something that adds value, which is something that a lot of people in production haven't been comfortable, well, comfortable talking the, about. I think that's the key to everything that you just said. So the evolution has been in the hardware and maybe the software, but what you're talking about is the strategy. And the role, yeah. And that's, that's the difference. When it mm -hmm. becomes strategic, when it mm -hmm. becomes another tool in the business arsenal, mm -hmm. and I know you talk a lot about growth, mm -hmm. production should be linked to client growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, of course, production Don't is... Don't say of course. <laughs> production <laughs> is, not sure that everybody <laughs> I mean, like, production is how a client materialized their marketing their marketing needs. Exactly. Uh, and it needs to be something where where you enable you enable the, the client to be able to have those meaningful conversations 
which is really fun. And engagement, to your point, engagement. because you don't see it as entertainment, you see it as engagement, exactly. which gets me to data-driven. Mm -hmm. So you very much believe in data-driven production. Oh, yeah, of course. But when I look and I listen to some of your interviews and I read what you write, I think there are people who would argue that, uh, and I'm sure there are actually, that some of what you say actually belongs to the media people. Some of it belongs to the social people. Some of it belongs to whoever. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is that it's all part of mm -hmm. the chain. I mean, for better or Which for is worse, way different. I happen to agree with you, but I, I... For better or for worse, I've always seen myself as somebody who likes to connect things and unite people. When I started, I ended up in advertising, like many of us, by serendipity. I started at a very young age um, coding on computers because my mother thought that it was the future and I really liked coding for computers, which gets me into motion graphics. I used to produce music records for my friends and do photography. So when I look at the essence of who I am as an individual, it was always about creating independently of what channel and what model. As I've grown up, I'm very interested on markets. I got to discover the world and cultures and, and bringing people together. That's why most of my jobs are regional or global, bringing those things and bringing the best out of, out of people, understanding the local culture and how do they play to, to be fantastic as, as one entity. And when I look at divisiveness, I've always created integrated production teams because I believe that creativity doesn't have shape, right? It needs to flow across this thing. And the boundaries between creativity and production should be kind of blurred. And the ones between production and media should be kind of blurred as well. Because through having conversations with media, I know who I'm telling stories to, how to tell better stories, right? Which at the end of the day, it's all about storytelling. And how can I improve my storytelling over, over time? So I... I truly believe that by bringing cultures, teams, those things together and having that visibility and be able to strategize. So basically what you've said, it. if I could rephrase some of your writing and what you just said, you've taken collaboration from a very nice philosophy that we talk about mm -hmm. at, client, at client meetings and at company meetings mm -hmm. into actually your production strategy. Yeah, Because it's those, production yeah. brings things together. So mm -hmm. you've looked, you look at both sides of it. You mm -hmm. bring the process together but you do the you bring the process together by bringing all the pieces of it together, mm -hmm. which I think is amazing. It's different. I think that people curiosity is one of the things that I enjoy the most and learning the most. Curiosity from what clients want, what clients are doing. Sometimes I look at what what a client is doing with their in-house studio because clients are obsessed about their own brands and what they do. And sometimes they do things with their own in-house studio that makes me rethink: Are we doing the right way as an industry, and should we adopt some of those things into? into the in-house studio. How do you connect what they can do in their in-house studio with what we do in the agency, with what we do in the in the industry? I think it's all about curiosity, openness, and what is the value of, or, or what is the benefit connecting those things together? And as how opposed do you to add, excluding. Right, and how do you add more value? And how you add more value. Because I think that's really always the key. Mm -hmm. Always the key is how do you add more value to, mm -hmm. the, to the process? And I think mm -hmm. that's really important. So let's talk a little bit about work. What um, do you want to talk about just, work? So there's so much, you have 400 awards, I and mean, there's so much, like, I couldn't mm -hmm. even begin mm -hmm. to go through your entire corpus of work. It's amazing. But there were a couple okay. of pieces that I thought were just really cool. So tell us about the Mariana Trench and James Cameron, because I'm obsessed with Cameron. Mm -hmm. And oh, that was I know, and I've, I've read everything about his, about his dives, mm -hmm. and recently he's been talking a lot because of mm -hmm. the tragedy that happened with that. And we're celebrating, we had done a documentary at, at the defunct JWT about um, a project that Rolex financed with, uh, with the US government going to the Mariana Trench to test uh, lubricants for the watches. And they had done it in the 50s. We did a documentary, which did very well. It was a very good story. Yeah, I saw it. It was amazing. I didn't and, realize it was your work. And, it was and, what I still, and what I still look at, look at um, what I still use that project with James Cameron is one, what branded entertainment is like, you have the brand of James Cameron, which is a passionate for the ocean. Is somebody that lives that with Rolex, which is about exploration and, and craftsmanship and National Geographic, and you put them together. And it was a very natural, it was a very natural fit. So when people do brand entertainment, they're like, let's do, a, let's do a program on Netflix. It's like, okay, but why on Netflix? What program, what creativity, what is the content? Like doing a something on Netflix is not- That's like saying, yeah, make me a viral. Yes, yeah, so make it a viral. Right. It's like the same thing. So it was a really good, it was a really good synergetic project. Also understanding one, the need for distribution, right? Like when, when 
we come up with, it was one of the first times coming up with a concept for entertainment from a creative agency where I realized the importance of media looking at distribution of that of that documentary as opposed to let's do it and then let's see where we put it out and it ended up at three in the morning in some regional regional channel. And also be able to understand that those projects have a one or two year life cycle, which is, that's why it's very difficult for brands to do entertainment, branded entertainment from marketing because they're looking at a three month, six month campaign. They're not looking at long-term ROI. So when you have those brands that have that ethos, that, that long-term creative platform, that's where you can make those those projects. The project was fantastic. I mean, like we shot it in. James wanted to to do that documentary with three D with three D cameras because he he uh, he was those exploring with cameras. that, he and that was his them. cameras. Right. He yeah. created those cameras. So we so imagine going to a place where you have eight times uh, atmospheric pressure with cameras that have been tested before that had to be carefully carefully aligned. Wow. We had to you know work with him creating the. It was fantastic. Did you go down? I didn't know. It, only him. He, the 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 summary was so small, small that he yeah, only fit yeah, yeah. in. But I spent a fair amount of time with time with him in Malibu doing the editing because he he did his own editing. He's he's a pure craftsman, and that's that's fantastic to see that level of talent and somebody who has done so much work throughout his life, hands on um, throughout the process, not just on on shooting, which it was obviously shot by himself while he was diving, but also on the editing room. I remember like this big uh, screening room that he has in his in his house, and seeing James Cameron editing on his wow. on his computer was massively inspiring. What, so you just inspired me because what you said was craftsman, mm -hmm. and I love the fact because you do talk about that a lot. The yeah. craft is not lost. Mm -hmm. Technology has not killed the craft. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of people who either think that or or are worried about mm -hmm. that. Some would love to think that's the case. So you don't need craft because. I think that somehow democratizes it more for them. But you believe in the craft. I believe in the craft from, from an individual's journey of self-expression and something that is conscious and taken care of. Even lack of, even lack of craft is craft. Right? Like Blair Witch Project was shot with a Super 8 video camera. It, it didn't have fantastic director of photography, great value. And yet it was very strong because of that. But it was a very conscious decision or somebody's journey or self-expression. And I think that's, that's what craft is. But that was their craft though. That was so I'm craft. with you, I, I, yeah. I got that. But that's craft, it's still craft. It's still, you can't just throw that out. You couldn't, they could have not done it. They could have said, we're just gonna do it amateurish, mm -hmm. but then it wouldn't have been what they did. Mm -hmm. They weren't quite amateurish. Mm -hmm. the, the, the backstory on Blair, which is something we should have a beer about, yeah. because the whole story is not true. <laughs> there, there are pieces of it. But it's are, a really good story. Yeah, but it's an awesome story. <laughs> but there's so many pieces of it that are exaggerated and whatever. It's, it's not important, but you, because where you are right is that they just looked at the craft in a different way. Mm -hmm. Easy Rider did the same thing in the 60s, right? Like before, before Easy Rider, everything was fiddler on the roof kind of productions, incredibly expensive, great directors of photography. And they, and they show with Easy Rider how a movie can be shot in 60 millimeters, which back then it was unheard of. And, and uh, in a much nimbler, nimbler One of my way. favorite movies, by the way. Yeah, the impact of my life, you have movie. absolutely no idea. And I think it's gonna be the same thing. There is craft in, in everything, as long as it's conscious and, and done and done in a way that, that is self-expression and, and people keep learning and growing. All right, so let's move from the deepest part of the sea to the heights of space, mm -hmm. the European Space Project mm -hmm. and the International Space Station. Oh, that was that was a great project. That's a project that um, I had just arrived in, in London. I think it was my first year in London. And, um, and I had a lot of ambition. I wanted to, I had worked in fantastic places like Anomaly, JWT was, was great back then. So I always worked in places and uh, McCann London had a very small production team and I had a big ambition of making it an integrated, creative, it was the beginning of, of content, and I needed to ignite it with something, right? And, and so we started, said like, we, we need to go and work not just with clients, but we need to get into music videos, which we did. And what pro interesting projects are over there? And there was this um, RFP from the UK government on going to the space station to show the educational content with Team Peak. I said, we have to, we have to do that. Like and, and we, it was the first government project that we did over there, and it was it was a very full on, full on project that was really good, and it was a, it was fantastic because it puts the challenges of production to the eleventh hour. You talk about craftsmanship, 
obviously I thought, well, if we're in the space station, this needs to look like 2001 a Space Odyssey. So let's bring cameras. Obviously, I was like, the, within minutes, I was like, well, you have to think about weight because we have to airlift <laughs> with rockets and every pound consumes this huge amount of fuel. And two, uh, we're going to need about a year of testing for everything that is not pre-approved in case it catches fire because, you know, there's a lot of oxygen over there. And I imagine you have to also teach them how to use the cameras. And, and Team Peak, yeah, to, like where do you put the camera, where do you put do, it, where do you yeah. know, all that, all that stuff. That was the fascinating part of the process is, is training, training an astronaut on, on storytelling, how to tell stuff, making decisions and pre-production was, cre- was key, right? And, and along the way, you're talking about decisions of what was good enough. There is this one uh, experiment that had a, where he was showing uh, gravity with a, with a rubber ball. And, uh, and I wanted an orange ball because everything is white and dark blue and it needed to pop up. And same thing, I had somebody knocking and said like, we haven't tested an orange ball. If you can go with yellow, it will save 1.6 million. I said like, I think I can go with yellow. <laughs> <laughs> so one more piece of work. So we went from here to there and now we're going to come back to here. Walmart, mm-hmm. Web3. Yeah. I mean, Walmart was, was, a great, was a great project because it required a lot of things like our media team. Uh, when you look at people like Eric Levin and, and, and his team, the challenge was production-wise, producing in an in a environment that few people have developed on. It was first year, year and a half of Web3, so who do you work with? But also you had to deal with a lot of things on that don't end up in camera, such as legal terms, right? Like how do you, how do you acquire real estate in, a, in the metaverse with cryptocurrency while it's fluctuating and it's every CFO's uh, biggest nightmare. nightmare. So we right. created this thing called Lion Vault, which is, a, which is a process for clients to be able to buy um, space and interact in Web3 and with crypto. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was a great project and still seen as one of the best performing Web3, Web3 experiences in a partnership with Roblox. And did it keep, is it ongoing? Yeah, it's still it's so ongoing. It's, ongoing, it's, it's something well. you set up and then it just sort of self It's good engaging, it's, it's entertaining, it's a gamification of the experience with, with the client. Right. Yeah, no, the relationship it. with Walmart really is cool. great. All right, so let's go back to the, let's go back to the jury. Mm-hmm. You are creating the jury. Yeah, I, it's, like it's your dream it's a dream. Jury. It's a dream jury, right? Like we're talking about what is next, what is going on, a moment of disruption. Be able to have this jury at a moment where there are so many conversations. Talking about Web3, Web3 was just 12 months ago. So it's not like it has disappeared and we're going to be seeing that kind of work. We're going to be seeing AI. We're going to be seeing mobile, new digital, what things are happening in content, having to evaluate. I mean, most of the people, when you look at content on platforms like TikTok, that's self-creative, created, how do you evaluate that? So it's, I mean, I love the exercise of the jury this year on from selecting the jury, creating the categories, to actually how do you set the standard of how do we look at those things that are totally different and work in a different way of everything that we've done before. Well, it's also a big disruption because the fact is I've been jury president any number of times. Jury presidents do not choose their own juries, Mm -hmm. but you've been given this huge opportunity to do something new and pick the people. It's... I think the whole industry is going to be watching. I this. mean, instead of pick the people, I, I want to look at it as bring the people together because right. there is great, well, the because there is great right, talent. Exactly. I don't want to look at it right, as like you, it. yes, you know. Is, yeah, it's like, how do you bring the people together? It's how do I bring people together with, with three things. People that have show a creative DNA in everything that they do. People that have been part of the evolution and part of the conversation and people that can articulate that and set up the standard for for the next for the next years to come. And I think the criteria, the the overall criteria, are pretty clear. Fifty percent mm-hmm. creative, fifty percent like did it actually work? Mm-hmm. Was it good? Yeah. So what are you going to be looking for? So I'm gonna I want to I'm thinking I'm sitting out there. I'm one of our people. My agencies do. I think we're really innovative. I think we're totally cutting edge. We're mm-hmm. doing amazing stuff. What should I be thinking about? That you're going to be you're looking, doing like, looking at, so that when you look at my work, staff on the service of what, but I think that that's critical because now we can do amazing stuff. But my question is, amazing stuff on the service of what? What have you used this amazing stuff that you that you have? How does this link with our industry, which is advertising? Um, and there is space, and there is space for showing the possibilities, right? Like there is, I think there is all the other. Um, 
places where that can be celebrated. When I look at, at the New York Festival and, and how they look at the other pieces of work, I think that is very important that we look at what amazing things we've done on the service of growing our clients' business. Which comes back to where we started when you were talking about the billboard mm -hmm. and all that you could have done, and then mm -hmm. you realized you didn't really need to do that. Yeah. And you could do it for a third of the price mm -hmm. and yeah. still have the same engagement. Yeah. It doesn't need to be something complicated, it's something to be meaningful at the time of disruption. When there is a lot of noise, I'm looking for those pieces that are gonna that are gonna set the tone for a year to come in the same way that BMW films set up the tone for creative content in the same way that of I can course. go on and on and on on those kind of things. And at a time, by the way, that nobody understood what they were doing. Exactly. I think that's the best definition. At a time where nobody knows what they're doing, who are going to be these anchoring pieces that we're going to build from in the future? Actually, I'd say even more. I think at the time of BMW, which is some of my favorite, mm -hmm. that early work is some of my favorite work, there's nobody to watch it. Mm -hmm. They couldn't stream it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's nobody to watch it. Most people didn't have the ability mm -hmm. to have speeds mm -hmm. and power that was big enough for it actually to work. And but yet, so everybody much talked about it because yeah. it was so good. And they were good. But they created so much noise that people were downloading it and watching it on tape. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like they, people would had just, they would do anything to see it. To watch it, which I think that's, that's, to me, a clear example of something that was beautifully crafted and creatively was great and had an impact. Right, I agree. So, Sergio Lopez Ferrero, thank you. No, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, thank you so much. I really what a I great feel conversation. like I, I feel I should pay you for, <laughs> for this masterclass. Just even even studying up mm -hmm. and and reading about it, I've always been fascinated by by production. Okay. You know, it's something when I was young, we all had to learn mm -hmm. the basics of production. But the truth of the matter is, as I said production used to be you you, you took a. I mean, one of the first things, obviously, that you learned was you had a great creative idea, mm -hmm. but until the producer took it to the director, you had absolutely nothing. Because mm -hmm. the, the director and the producer would change your idea, make it real to your point, give you the, create the engagement. Mm -hmm. But it was always the same conversation. I think every agency in the world had the same thing. You would take your boards down, and I'm only talking now about film, to the production department and to get an estimate. And somehow it was always a million dollars. Always. Always. It didn't make a difference. <laughs> it's what you had. No, no, actually, all I need is like, yeah, a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And I think to your point, it's so changed. And the notion of thinking about not the big idea, but the creative platform is transformational. So I thank you for that. Thank you. And, thank you for having me. It's been a great we're, looking, we're looking forward to great things from this jury. Mm -hmm. I'll have you back with some of the people from the jury and mm -hmm. we'll actually look at the work. Give you a chance to talk about the ideas, all the things that you saw, what what really excited you, what inspired you, what didn't. Because mm -hmm. I think it's important. We won't mention names, we won't mention work, but I think it's important for people to mm -hmm. understand that as well, so that they get that it's not about the tech, but it's about what it does. It's mm -hmm. about how it changes the world. And in our case, changing the world is great, but we also have to change our clients' business because I think mm -hmm. that's what we do. So, what can I say? You've all had a chance to be part of an incredible masterclass in what production is today, but more importantly, what production is gonna to be tomorrow and next year, because I think that's what we, what we really heard today. It's don't, don't lock yourself in. You have to think big, think strategically. It's completely different. So this is David Sable on behalf of New York Festivals. Creativity from the other side coming to you from Silverstein Studios in Lower Manhattan at the World Trade Center. And you can see behind us the, the beauty of the space that we're in and my new FOD friend, of David, <laughs> who I'm just so, so excited to, to be in touch with and to know Sergio. And we'll see you next time. What can I say? Thank you and out.